Hello and welcome to Black Creative Healing. My name is Natasha Thomas and I am your host for these conversations with other Black creatives about the use of their creative selves for healing, for themselves, for their communities, for the world at large, um, and all the ways in which that can manifest um, through their expertise, through their experience, um, these are meant to be sort of informal conversations that you might draw inspiration from for yourself, um, that we as the people engaging in these conversations with each other um, might find ourselves reinvigorated by the sharing that we do. Um, and that we also will literally create something together. Um, we're gonna be um, making art that is either inspired by our conversations or perhaps serves as a foundation for new conversations. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes of whatever we make. So I hope that you are as excited as I am to go on this journey together because it's about to get real. <laughs> So for our first interview of this series, our first collaboration of the Black Creative Healing series, I sit down with Anika McDonald, a social worker in Florida. Um, she and I talk about the African diaspora. Both of us um, are children of the Caribbean um, and uh, grew up with that influence uh, in different ways, but uh, with a lot of similarities that you'll hear us um, discuss. Um, we talk about the sexualization of uh, the Black female body, um, particularly in Black Caribbean contexts. Um, we talk about self-love and what that looks like um, in conversation and in movement um, in part two. Yes, because there are two parts to this. Part one was just so big that it had to stand alone by itself. So the conversation, uh, the verbal uh, interview is what's being shared now. And then in a couple of days, we'll drop part two, uh, where you get to see an art space collaboration um, between Anika and myself. Um, we do a little dance collaboration. I'm very, very excited for y'all to enjoy uh, this very first interview collaboration of Black Creative Healing. Let's get into it. My name is Anika McDonald um, and I am, a, I like to say a creative clinical social worker. Um, All right. <laughs> I, use, I do mental health therapy and assessments and I use my creative tools a lot with that, especially like drawing and art, but um, I'm a dancer and model outside of that. And I am here to play. <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, so I always, I also like to give the backstory of like how we met as well. Um, mm -hmm. People are going to be so sick of me talking about Black Sunshine Retreats. <laughs> but still. Because there's so many of us that met that way, you know, um, that I hope to involve in this. So um, yeah, so we met at Nona's. Uh, Black women's spiritual retreats. And I remember that I was particularly, and I'm hoping we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, but particularly honed into you doing during the workshop that we did on like sensuality and movement. And I remember being like, there is a person who is really comfortable <laughs> with herself and doesn't need anybody else to be involved in that, like at all. Wow. <laughs> That's I remember funny. that just stuck with me. Because <laughs> I feel like that's always the impression I give off people, especially when I'm doing sensuality movements. But I am so internally, like, freaking out because yes! I've been, like, sexy my whole life. Like, I was a kid that was called sexy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's always been... This transition to adulthood has been one of me trying to accept my sexiness or sensuality because it was told to me that I wasn't supposed to be for so long. Ah, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> we get told to hide that from a very, very early age. <laughs> yeah. Especially being a kid that people consider as fast or I was a kid that was dating an adult, of course. So it was like a lot of blame. <laughs> you see the shorts that you wear, you see the this, the, your body, your body. My mom used to say that my sister and I, we have to wear different clothing 
because my body is different. Mm. <laughs> yes. I didn't have the bodies that I saw on TV, like with the big butts and stuff. So I just had no idea what they were trying to demean in me or put down in me, but it was just always something. And then as I grew older, I just kept that mindset. Like I knew I was an adult, but I was like, ah, uh, let me. So that day was like, I was like, I hope they don't think I'm too much. Like, <laughs> It was so funny. What I remembered about you was the um, expressive therapy because we did do oh. the uh, music therapy. You helped to, you helped me find my voice, and I, oh, I remember okay. saying, oh, "Wow!" Like I knew that there was a way you could do art and therapy, but I never saw it actualized. Yeah, I saw like therapy techniques, of course, that used art, but like just the way you navigated that, like. <laughs> oh man that's yeah. not cool to hear because like we yeah they were like little mini sessions that I was doing these little like musical affirmations that you could sign up for this one-on-one -on -one time um mm -hmm. with me to help build and yeah it was it was a really moving experience for me too because I think and it's funny because you know how like you look back at something and you can see the seeds of something yeah that you didn't know was forming then like I see the seeds of this back then because yeah. we were that was probably the first instance where I realized how um, powerful it was to work with other Black creatives and specifically Black women yeah. in finding ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Like in art, like I knew that, like categorically I knew that. And just like you said, you've seen therapeutic techniques applied through the arts before. Like we know that on a cognitive level, but when you experience it and when you actually dive into it, um, I think the spiritual piece as well, because yeah, yeah. spirituality for me has been something I've been so private about because I have no idea what other people believe in and mm -hmm. there's so much demonization. Yes. It sounds different. Yep. So I've been so quiet about, but to have that vulnerability in front of you and to share yeah. some deep things while developing, and it was positive. Like it wasn't yes. a dramatic place. It was just like positive going forward, progressive. Yeah. Being like, wow, she sees my spirit. And I remember even the, <laughs> the music was two voices of mine. Yeah, like the soft, the soft voice that I think like the childlike, yeah. and the deep, more like adult, like getting me along, like yes. And I was like listening to that over and over when I left. It kind of helped me to get out of that space I was in. Mm -hmm. so that's a seed for me that helped me to even get to like yes, yeah, sensual movements. I'm here. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like like you said, there's something that's so um, uh, that's so heavily stigmatized in us, us being like black women. <laughs> and I think there's an element too, where I can safely say like black Caribbean women too, yeah. that like our families for, I think no fault of their own, it's generational trauma, but we are heavily, heavily scrutinized and we heavily scrutinize ourselves yeah. to make sure that people don't get the wrong impression of us, you know? Because like you said, I didn't have a body growing up that was like the ones on TV being hypersexualized. At least I didn't think so. But yeah. I remember, you know, it was nothing strappy. Um, you had to make sure that you had layers on. You had to have like the undershirt, even as a kid, because God forbid anybody see a hint of a nipple. <laughs> they can't exist. As far as Anyone should know. Made it like, oh, you'll catch cold. Really? <laughs> no, that's not why. We all know that's not why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and like not being able to wear anything too form fitting, mm -hmm. even though I didn't really have an ass until after college. <laughs> you know, like my ass yeah, came I grew up in Jamaica, and my, even my school clothes was like my skirts were down here. It was a lot. It was over the top like yeah our tunics were boxy i just remember i i grew out a tunic and i wore it like snatched it up one day and i was the hot girl of the school because my tunic was short <laughs> and everybody kept asking do you have on bloomers and bloomers are panties but it was just like because i said yes okay it's acceptable but don't wear it again and and when we ever had a jeans day i'd be the girl wearing my tight up shirt and my mom she did allow me some autonomy yeah, we got to America, mm. and then I guess it was more like first of all, 
be quiet. We're, we're immigrants. Don't call attention to yourself. This is right. not the same. And whatever system to fit into, we need to fit into it. And that's the yeah. Thing. <laughs> yeah, the assimilation piece, huge. Huge. <laughs> Because I, I wasn't born on the island my parents were born on. I was, you know, born and raised in the U.S. But it's interesting to see how, yeah, they're even even them now, like, I think if they were to come to the U.S. at this point in their lives, they probably would have had a different experience or feel yeah. differently about assimilation now after having lived here, you yeah. know, all this time. But early on and in raising us, it was like, don't make anybody look at you sideways. Yeah. <laughs> Fit in. <laughs> fit in. Try to fit in. Do what they're doing. Celebrate Thanksgiving. Yes! <laughs> you, okay, so this is, we're, because we're filming this as Halloween is coming up, did you do, did you have to like hide for Halloween? <laughs> I never celebrated a Halloween until I became an adult because I, yeah. it was something I did in Jamaica and my what? mom was like, the devil? What is this? <laughs> and yep. then um, I had no interest in it because yeah. it was just, I came here at 10, 11, and I thought I was better than everyone. Like, I just, if I could be real, like, I just, I hate it here. I want to go back to my country. <laughs> so I, I was forcing myself to not assimilate until I remember yeah. talking to someone. They're like, oh, you sound like an American now. And I was like, shit. <laughs> Even like with art. And then I think I, I went into a school where assimilating would make me popular. Basically, like the way I was was not going to make me popular, and I hated being bullied. Yeah. So I went straight in in one summer, and I just became American. But that also talks about like the art. Like the yeah. art I was listening to was completely different. The art I was focused on, like stepping, wasn't yeah. something I did. Yeah. The the way I danced was sexual for Americans. I changed that. Yeah. Yeah. I the, the <laughs> yeah. The art piece as as a tool or as a weapon almost of assimilation is real too yeah. like i i feel like there's an entire um there's a generational gap for me in terms of my knowledge of music and dance that i would have had i think if i were growing up either on the island or with a closer tie to the music of the island at that time. You know, like I always tell people whenever you meet someone, you're meeting a time capsule of where that person is in their lives. I feel like for immigrant families that that's also true of them artistically. Like the music that I know from growing up is the music that was popular on the island when my parents were coming of age there and when they left. So like for me, my knowledge of like reggae and calypso music stops in 1979. <laughs> Like I don't I was listening to a playlist the other day of like reggae and dance hall hits from nineteen eighty and beyond and I was like Who is this? <laughs> and that's so funny because <laughs> that when I came to America I was I we had music that was um, Americanized. Actually I listened to mostly American music in Jamaica, but it was just so different. When I came to the States, the music that they were listening to, like regionally yeah, I have no concept of like, and even when relating with people and they talk about prior to 2000, when they yeah. talk about prior to 2000 music, I have to be like, who, who is this person? Because it really is just, that's the difference. And in that, the dancing, like my dancing was, <laughs> I mean, when I went back to Jamaica for the summer and came back to America, I'm like right back. It's like I rejuvenated right back to who I was. And mm -hmm. I had the dutty mind, like, yes, this is this is it. And my friends were like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Listen, like kids are doing this in Jamaica and the stucky and and things that are that seem sexual to you, but we we're not thinking of this as sexual at all. And it it it, it that also ties into the sensuality pieces because it made me so embarrassed because I'm the vulgar girl in school now, like <laughs> with the short shorts. Matter of fact, like I went to a party and I had on a skirt and they said, yeah. I would wear a skirt to a party. And all I could think about was like my norm is we would yeah. to a party because nobody cares about up under you when you're dancing. <laughs> yeah. So it's like hiding that sensuality because it's so pronounced amongst people who they weren't accepting it, at least not where I was yet. They didn't know how to see a comfort with your body 
as a standalone thing, right? Like I think that there are entire corners of every culture, I think, like just entire conservative corners that don't know how to separate or what's the phrase that I'm looking for? They have no concept of the fact that there's a whole spectrum of yeah. comfort within sensuality yeah. to sexuality and that one does not equal the other. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> or even just like we do have specific dance moves that do stimulate sex, like Daga. Yeah. Or um, my parents used to Google. I don't remember the name of it. Google, Google, <laughs> which is which is a connotation for sex as well. But yeah. it, was a, it was a dance simulating that, and I guess like that could look like the the dances back in the day here. Swing dancing was very provocative. Yeah. <laughs> um. So it's like purposefully putting these things in the forefront but just what that means for my culture versus your culture and just the unawareness of what that looks like and I think yeah. I quiet that so much like I don't want to wind my waist versus like someone who can wind their waist easily because they're doing um, belly dancing which is yeah. so sexual <laughs> um, different culture and different mindset yeah yeah, yeah it's interesting for me because I, I studied belly dance for over a decade now and I honestly think that I reached out to it or I was drawn to it because I didn't feel that I so I feel like belly dance allowed me to access a piece of my sensuality that I was not allowed to access as a Caribbean person <laughs> it was like a shortcut for me like yeah. I felt like okay so I'm not allowed to wind my waist I'm not allowed or I you know it's a problem if I do these things. I'm too sexual if I do these things. But if I put it in this context of this other culture, yeah, <laughs> that's my way in. And I'm just now, not like just this minute, but like recently coming to terms with how problematic that is. Yeah. And I, I don't, I, belly dance will always be a part of my dance history. Like yeah. it, I learned so much from it, but that culture is not mine, <laughs> you know? And I, I learned, that I, I was using it, you know, for lack of a better term, it's, it's not mine and I was using it. And so now I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm finding my way back to my own sense of dance home, understanding, yeah. you know, understanding yeah. the tools yeah. that I, that I learned from belly dance. I was thinking that because I, I was around African Americans when I came to America. So I was in an enclave. Uh, when I came to America, I lived in an enclave. Okay. I did not see interact with white people on a general basis until college Woo! opposite yeah. for me <laughs> that like i people always ask why didn't you go to a, a, a hbcu and it, because it was never at the forefront of my mind to connect with black people because it was so normal natural oh, happened. Yeah. um i went to all black schools i went to i lived in poverty so i lived amongst dark people brown and black and um so popping and twerking was my way out, but it was still hidden, but it was popular amongst them. Like it was hidden. Like I posted it on my um, YouTube, but I would never promote it. Like I would never tell anyone that I'm a, a twerker, even though in the dances and the parties at school, yeah. like, yes, that's the go-to. Yeah. I kind of stole from it too, because it was it was easier for me to fit in with Black Americans than try to stand out as a Jamaican person whining because it was even more even the Black Americans thought that was sexual. So I was like, whoa, <laughs> like let me yeah. let me back it up a little bit and just do what they're doing because uh, we go on our heads, we're splitting, we are putting our legs in the air, and they're just moving their waist. Um, and even in that sense there's still limits and barriers. Like you can, you can twerk a little bit, but don't, you know, so I use that culture as well, but I, I do feel connected to that culture. Cause I was yeah. still a yeah. preteen when I came here. Yeah. But it's still more like, even when someone asks me, what do you dance? I say hip hop. Hmm. But really I dance dance hall. I am a island baby still. So I, that dance home thing you're talking about, hmm. I find it in Afrobeat. Hmm. I have a home in it. I find I find that my body is more natural in melodic movements. Like Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That melodic piece is huge. I feel like people expect us 
us being just like black people in America <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> to be so um like everything is supposed to be percussive, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, there's a place for that in our bodies, I think, in everybody, you know? But I, I've, I've always been somebody that was really drawn to melodic movement too. Mm-hmm. And I find, I find a home in the idea of extension. Like I, you know, in opposition to, to the way you grew up, I was entirely surrounded by white people <laughs> <laughs> with occasional trips to the Caribbean side of the family. And, um, you know, I, I didn't really get a chance to interact heavily with black people until college. Wow. Um, yeah. So I, so all of this sort of like coming home to myself and my blackness was happening when I was like 17, 18, 19, like much, much later mm-hmm. than a lot of other people. <laughs> um, and I, I feel like it's still a work in progress. Like, I don't know that I have a musical place that I can completely call home yet. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I, <laughs> I said the same because like yeah. identity is disrupted. Like yes, <laughs> disrupted is a good word for it. Like, I know my home is Jamaica, but when I go back to Jamaica, I'm I feel strange. Like oh, you don't really know here. You know, like I I'm in a time capsule of the nineties. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And then when I'm around Black Americans that are that family is from America, I can feel the disconnect a lot. Like. Uh, just culturally, I'm just unaware and I sound like a white person asking questions. It's yeah. really bad. Yeah. And then when I'm around white people, because I am aware of their culture, because it's like oppressed, it oppresses us. I mean, so because I'm aware yeah. of it, I, um, I can interact well through it. Just like other Caribbean people, we seem to navigate yeah. through white culture easy, but do. it's not mine I don't feel I don't feel anything closeness to it so like musically I'm so eclectic yeah yeah like, there's no there's no one space yeah but I, I do realize that all those things that I thought of like white dancing like modern even though these aren't white dances but like these things that I saw more white people doing I mm-hmm. never accepting my own self for doing them I'm like what am I doing what am I trying to do like right yeah I took ballet for years and I was always the tall lanky kid they stuck in the back because I just couldn't get it together like I just <laughs> but I loved the extension of it I felt I felt that there had to be a place for me in it somewhere it just wasn't in Devil's Lake, North Dakota. <laughs> it's funny because it's not until I saw Missy Copeland, the Black Ballet, that I yes. realized, oh, wow, we can't exist because that's something I always wanted to do. Yeah. And I went to, um, so I never got technique, dance technique until I went to college. Got it. Okay. Yep. Yeah. The other way around. I got it. Yeah. Around. So I was like seeking, because everything was casual in my neighborhood. Like it was, it was, there were no resources, so we came together, watched music yeah. videos, yeah. came up with dances. That, that was my training, but I love it that way because I feel yeah. like it was so rooted. But I tried yeah. ballet, and I felt like I, I was shapely. <laughs> yeah. like shape was too big, and I'd been modern. And fortunately for me, I had a black dance teacher. Nice. Changed like everything. Yeah. yeah. It changed my concept of emotions because I didn't think we were allowed to have those type of emotions and show them on stage. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. It makes such a difference. And I'm still, I'm still looking for a black dance instructor. <laughs> I've been exploring. I've been exploring. But uh, yeah, there is a difference when we learn from ourselves, you mm-hmm. know, and it's uh, like, it's important to me in this project that, um, that blackness and that need to be affirmed by ourselves is centered, you know? Yeah. yeah. I've, and I've said this before to like my white ally friends and, and people, you know, that like, I, I love you. <laughs> you know, if you're in my life, obviously I got love for you, but I can't center you here. I can't. Yeah. And that's okay. Cause they're centered in a lot of other spaces. Everywhere else. <laughs> Everywhere else. <laughs> it's, it's amazing to have like black creative, black creativity is, Honestly, it's something that I noticed that we've been growing into more recently as pop culture. Yeah. But there's still so much to unravel because blackness already has an idea and concept. This is blackness and that's it. And there are so many alternatives to that 
Yeah. Even the black person can feel disconnected from what that looks like artistically. Yes. <laughs> yes. And we have, I think we I hate to use the word police ourselves, but it's kind of what we do. Like we, we want to be sure that we are the representatives, right? Yeah. So it's like, yeah. it has to look a certain way, it has to be a certain way or else it's not authentic. It's not real. It's not, yeah. it's like, can't we give ourselves, can't we, can't we free ourselves of the idea that we have to be all things wrapped up in individual packages? Yeah. Like, can't we be individuals? Yeah. <laughs> like I used to be so attracted to alternative music. I didn't see a lot of black people in it, but no. I wasn't listening because they were black. I was listening because my teenage angst needed that. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and it was like, when I went to a school that was more, I went to schools that you taught on the first day. Like, <laughs> This is point blank period. I went to the schools that you see on TV that are like, you need the white savior to come in, give us something to help us. I went mm -hmm. to that. Like, not really super violent in that way, but just kind of like on the edge of we're yeah. not really getting anything. So to socialize, to survive, I felt like I had to put those things behind me. Like, not to sound like, Wah, 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 they made fun of me because they didn't. I cannot lie and say I was bullied my whole life, but I kind of like downplayed some more things that weren't black. Like, uh, oh, yeah, this is alternative music, but uh, rap underground. <laughs> or, yeah, I love to dance like modern, but you know, twerk. Like, you know, like I wanted to make sure that yeah. I didn't seem like I was an Oreo, which is something that I found offensive. Yep. Yeah. I am who I am. It doesn't mean I want to be anything else. So mm -hmm. the, the creative spaces I always seek always had white people because that was what I was seeking and nobody was brave or bold enough to say, hey, we, we're here. We're represented too. We are also artsy and we also see the world this way and we, we're abstract and we're this. Yeah. 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 And that that can be authentic too, that we yeah. have community in that in creativity right like that we can still find ways to be exploring and expanding and experimenting with ourselves <laughs> yeah and still be centering blackness like yeah. that it's all it's possible your experience in blackness like yours with just like growing up around black white people and is as valid as me growing up and never yeah <laughs> Like my my white people were my friends that were mixed. <laughs> yeah. We call them white just because right they have one white parent or a quarter white parent, mm -hmm. and so like me yeah. experiencing all that doesn't mean that I still even know what blackness means for myself. Like okay, you you've been around. I've been around it my entire life. I'm from a black nation. I went to college, and even though I went to a PWI, I in, integrated with just black Americans. Like. And Caribbeans, like I never, I probably went to one party that was like not black. So yeah. even though my life is all black people, black nation, black history, my household, like everything, like all the things that people are becoming aware of now has always been my life. I still have a disconnect. Like, yeah, there's yeah. Still a disconnect about who am I really? What do I represent? How do I look? What are we supposed to react? How do we react? What yes. are attitudes like? Yes, and there's something so powerful about connecting to each mm -hmm. other on that. That even though you and I can come from such different backgrounds, mm -hmm. we are connected by that. <laughs> yeah. You know that uncertainty, that um, like curiosity and drive to sort of define something for yourself that the yeah. world has tried to define for you. I think that there comes an insecurity with blackness, mm -hmm. um, if I could be honest, just because yeah. even within black people, there's so much anti-blackness and um, mm -hmm. green. So there's an insecurity about owning it and what yeah. it looks like. And yeah. then on the flip side, the insecurity of what pop culture tells, tells you blackness yep. is. Yeah. Down to that. Set. Like, down to yeah. that. I, I saw the thread on Twitter where people are showing their code switching. Yes. I don't code switch. I code switch to American. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah I code, I, my code switching probably happens more naturally where if I'm around a Caribbean person, I break down a little bit more. Yeah. If I'm around a black person, I'll use their slangs. Yeah. But yep. 
I was just looking at it like we intentionally yeah. <laughs> change how we speak because there's an insecurity that comes behind it. Like, yes, yep. I know for survival, but that's an insecurity thinking that you will lose survival just for being. Right. Yeah. Like there's nothing, uh, there's no, neither of us, I think are saying that there's not a valid source of that. You know, like you said that there's, there's a survival instinct that that comes from, but we have perpetuated living out of that survival instinct and out of yeah. that trauma. I don't believe even blackness sounds. <laughs> like, yeah. like, why do we think like, even when I'm on the phone, I can tell this is a black person. Like when, when did someone tell me this is what we have to sound like <laughs> for yeah. us to be considered black. And I think that all stems from pop culture. Like, Hey, this is what black. And if you even bring it all the way back from minstrel shows, showed yeah. you what blackness looked like yeah. from yeah. a different perspective and we yeah. own it. We own it. Yeah. It's constantly being stolen from us and then fed back to us. Yeah. <laughs> like and it's just this like nasty or it not it is, but it can become this nasty sort of like centipede. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like we're not yeah, and I, yes, I know I am black, but the TV is showing me what blackness looks like. And let me, like me watching, I remember because it was purposeful. Like I need to figure out how to get along with these people at my school before they stop calling me names and talking about my accent. I watched like Baby Boy. <laughs> I watched like the Wood, the classics, you know, and, like even to see how black people were supposed to sound. Yeah, based on black people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Based yeah. on people who are black who know that they're different, that's yeah. why I, I I have like a very intense respect for Issa Rae mm. because she showcased blackness as is, like right. Yeah, and I love I appreciate too that for like all all of her awkwardness and all of her fumblings, you know, yeah. that's all out front. Yeah, you know? because that is it is awkward and it is. <laughs> Fumbly and messy, and I I appreciate seeing that. Yeah, rather than oh, Unfiltered. we're always cool, we're always laid back, we're always yeah. you know assertive. That's not necessarily true. You have you have the black geeks, you have the black um, yeah jocks, you have the black jerks, you have people. Right? Yeah, who, uh, we needed to see we needed to see valley girls that were black, like my sister and her friends. Like <laughs> like we needed, and that's. I think that's the good thing about how I was raised is that I was able to see that, but the disconnect happened in me finding that pop culture to be my truth rather than what I experienced. Yeah. 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 And I think part of the reason for that is because it gets funneled back through whiteness, you know, yeah. it gets consumed and regurgitated. And then, like I said, fed back to us and we're expected to take that and, make something of it yeah <laughs> you know yeah, stereotypes work because we yeah. hold on to stereotypes like being a jamaican woman someone will say oh my gosh they stole and i'll be like what a jamaican and it's like it's not true right you don't want to hear a white person say that but yeah you know but i'm just the stereotypes that we hear we we often like like we create them. Like, yeah like let, let me be that so like when they say Oh, you know, when I was thinking about modern dancing or ballet, like anytime I said like I danced and it wasn't answering with that, I always felt like my dance wasn't important. Like, but yeah. that's a stereotype that these things are more superior because they are done by predominantly European people. Yes. Um, the hip hop and the dance hall that I'm doing that may not come with the technique, but comes with the talent is like and comes with that connectedness to history yeah like i would shy away from telling them oh, i dance but i wouldn't call myself a dancer i would never assert being a dancer because i didn't have i don't know what plie is and this and right this. i don't have classical training yeah uh, meanwhile yeah. i'm doing things where i have to break down like it's it's kind of like i did um a project for a speech class on hip hop and i had to do not just the music, but I wanted to showcase the culture of hip hop. Yes. And I was looking yep. at break dancing and like break dancing is casual. It's very street. Yeah. Um, yeah. They they turned it into some like, you know, just like hip hop that you can do it in the studio, but it's not the same. Right. Yeah. And 
I was looking at that like, yo, you would have to like sit down and train to get to some of these <laughs> poses. Yeah. Yeah. So then it is validated. It does have trial. It does. It is yeah. dance. It's, it's the yeah. same. Yeah. So, so we kind of value cool. one form over another. And that's yeah. Kind of even cool. us. <laughs> yeah. Even us. Yeah. Even us. I think there's this quote from a, I, I saw the beginning, I never saw the whole thing, but I saw the beginning of this documentary on soul food that mm -hmm. um, has a quote in it that I carry with me because I feel like it's so valuable. And it was that it's important for us as black people who live in America to complicate our understanding of history. Mm -hmm. And I think that that applies to our dance and our art forms and pop culture as well, that mm -hmm. it's important for us to understand and own the complexity of it not just to say this is ours and it's perfect as it is and mm -hmm. it only gets wrecked when white people take it. No, we mess with it ourselves too. Like we, mm -hmm. we harm ourselves too. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. think that's a very interesting quote because there, it is so complex and it is yeah. so like, there's so much overlapping, mm -hmm. um, even being from a, a, a country outside of America, observing America and then yeah. coming to live in America. Yeah. Just in that concept of, <laughs> I thought this was a place that like you hear about racism, but you don't see it. Um, yeah. When you're away from America and then coming here, how I regarded myself was different. So just yeah. even the complexities of that and how history impacts how I see myself mm -hmm. based where I'm at. Cause my history is the same. My personal history is the same, but being yeah. in a country where the history is different. Yeah. I feel like take that and go, Oh, that's why this is why that is why that's why this music is this. That's yeah. why they put this music down. That's why this isn't regarded. That's why they have their own award show. Like it's the time <laughs> capsule thing again. It's the time capsule. We were all, you know, all of us, from the diaspora stolen at different points in time. Yeah. Each of those points in time branched in completely different directions. Yes. And right. also, or, or, or removal from that system is different. Yeah. <laughs> or removal from that system and what it yeah. looks like after. Yeah. In America, there is no system after. That system continues to thrive in institutions. Yeah. Um, other spaces, that system looks like the removal impacted the country so much that we're like not even surviving and thriving. Yeah. With a different mindset. Like, <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's the diaspora wars are real, you know, like we're throwing all kinds of shit at each other across oceans, <laughs> yeah. you know, like we it's all a, came from the same place, but it's an know. anger. Yeah. And it, I think the anger is to self. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, it's an anger when you don't know where you really are from, to mm -hmm. be honest. You can do all the you know, right. DNA results, but right. you don't have it. And it's yeah. also an anger when you feel like you should know where I'm, what I'm dealing with. It's also like oppression wars. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. Which helps nobody. Nobody wins the oppression Olympics. Nobody. No. And then so I think about like as it comes to art, like there's so much similarity in art, but everyone wants to own whatever it is. Like right? we own this. We own that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not realizing that like they they're looking similar because you're from the same source. Yeah. And you're from the same source and with the interactions you've had and yeah. the stories you've had, it, it it blossomed into this, but yeah. Wow, it looks so similar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Instead of trying yeah. to find ownership in, I guess when you never had anything, you hold on to your very little thing. Yeah, yeah. I was talking with a, a black music therapist about this on Twitter the other day. The idea that like exceptionalism is a white supremacist construct that it's okay to, you can be an individual, yeah, but you don't have to hold on to this belief that you are the only exceptional person or the only yeah. exceptional branch of the African tree, you know, that this is the only authentic way that this is. That exceptional yeah. is a white That's supremacy. I think about like within music. Yeah. Lately you see a, a lot of music bites from different cultures. Yeah. I think it's beautiful. Yeah. Like, it's beautiful because it's like a sense of togetherness that's given us first of all sounds have to change you yeah. know 
we have to throw it in the app, and it to me it shows how much wider we are getting in understanding each other. Like, wow, this music yeah. can blend with this music because we really have a root that's the yeah, same. Yeah. But at the, the opposite end is like our art is attacked because people are like, oh no, but that is mine, and that was ours first, and this is, and I think it takes away from the beauty of right because it all. Because people can't see the nuance of the relationship, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like that pieces of art that are cultivated through people coming together in relationship and sharing pieces of what they have with each other is different than someone just coming in, snatching an excerpt and going, I'm going to plop this over here and it's mine now. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you it's mine. I'm not going to say it. Yeah. Like people conflate those two things again, because we can't see the nuance, you know, that the relationships, it is entirely possible still to cultivate meaningful relationships Mm -hmm. and sharing between and within all the diversity of black culture that exists out there. Mm -hmm. We just... Have you ever watched that Netflix, um, She's Gotta Have It? I, yeah, the new, the new one. I didn't get through much of season two, though. Uh, it felt like they were fanning the flames of the diaspora war, and I just didn't have the energy for it. <laughs> there was a, um, episode where the she, there's an episode where she did an art piece, and mm-hmm. it was basically black pain. She's. They don't really show the art piece when everyone's reaction, but you can gather from it that it's intense. <laughs> there's nudity and there's violence and yeah, it's intense. And the, the debate that was happening that they were showing were people saying, why do we keep showing black pain and suffering yeah. through our art? And then, yeah. people saying, you know, you're re-traumatizing, re-triggering. And I was just like, everyone's experience is valid. Yes. <laughs> For her to express her pain through that way, even if it's triggering, um, right. I feel like is necessary. Whereas yeah. the other part is, is necessary as well, where you show like the, the progress and the, the, the and pretty the part. And the joy. Yeah. Like I, the thing that I always keep in mind for myself is just maybe I'm not the audience for this and that's fine. Yeah. Everything has an audience, you know? Like maybe there are people who need to watch 12 Years a Slave eight times to really get it. I saw <laughs> it once and I will never fucking see it again. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. I know that about me. I'm not I that with M- Medea. Yeah. Yeah. So I think like yeah. a, a lot of people who are very educated or um, college educated, they have like a, a negative like standpoint on it. Yeah. But then I see people who are not as exposed who that it kind of like shows their reality Mm -hmm. and they see themselves on TV. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Oh wow. It has an audience that's, that needs that. Yeah. 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 um, That culture that he is expressing that we think he's making fun of, but, but he's actually just showcasing. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And there's, there's value in that too. It's just, I'm not the audience for title yeah. either. You know? <laughs> I'm still searching for, not searching, but I'm I'm learning. You know, I'm learning what I am the audience for. Like I watched the show Raising Dion, and I know people on Netflix and people have been pooping all over that show too, saying the acting is terrible, that little kid is yeah. awful, the show's so terrible. And I saw something in it that I loved, and will always have a soft spot for. You know, I think another thing, like just because you're black, don't mean that you're going to resonate. And <laughs> it's everything black art is not monolith just like we aren't. Yeah. And I think it goes back to me saying, like, I didn't feel like I could do these certain things. Yeah. Like, what would have happened if I thought that I could be an alternative singer? I would have pursued that, yeah. you know? So it's yeah. like, what if we can go away? It doesn't have to suit everyone. Yeah. But there's a little black girl here that might yeah. find um, purpose in this art. And that I think that kind of, helps with the security yes yes yeah Yeah. being mindful especially working in therapy and with mental health i want to be mindful at all times that i'm not um i'm not a part of society that increases or propensity for mental health Hmm. as i talk with i did social work so i'm always person in the environment and as i with people, I realize a lot of their issues is not even self-inflicted. It's just the environment that they are in and they have accepted. 
And I always want to be like my art to be a, a safe space. Like yes. yeah. here, everything is not telling you you're ugly here. Everything is not telling you that your feelings are invalid here. Everything uh, is not telling you that you can't feel frustrated by capitalism. Like I don't right. want to yeah. resonate to people's heart to see that they can be outside of what they've been taught to be and what brings them discomfort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that's that's the whole, like I, that's the whole point of therapy, right? Is like yeah. to, find, to find your uh, your own authentic path, right? Like so often people don't realize therapists aren't there to like give you advice and tell you what to do. Like we're just yeah. there to be a mirror for you. Yeah, be the environment that you're in. Maybe frame things a different way, you know, to help you get to a deeper understanding of self. And then ideally, we never want to see you again. Like, go out, ever. live your life. Don't get back. Yeah, <laughs> and if you do, we'll be like, I would love to see people's growth and talk with them, but it doesn't right. suit me. That That's just yeah. for me. That's a selfish yeah. desire. It doesn't yeah. suit them for them to have this space anymore because now it's a crutch. And yes, exactly. And that's certainly finding, the, finding themselves within like this self-improvement, self-healing is 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 gonna make me great like you know yeah, like, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I like the, the the other side of therapy the, yeah. <laughs> the parts that i get from it like huh if i'm telling them this i need to practice this or right uh, yeah i can see it being done visualizing yeah. with them and then showing them hey you remember three i just did that to a session today i was like a month ago <laughs> you couldn't visualize this you couldn't even think of it and yeah. now you're doing it. So, yeah, yeah. And to be, better. yeah, to lean into that authenticity of that relationship too, because that's something that I don't know if this was the way for you, like when you came through your training, I know that there was a lot of emphasis on objectivity and mm -hmm. distance between yourself and your clients. And yeah. now we're seeing this whole wave come back to, well, maybe a little bit of self-disclosure is not a bad thing. Maybe yeah. we can break from somebody's wall. I don't think black people work that way right we're naturally very, we don't <laughs> yeah we are very guarded um and it, it does come from our history a lot but we're very guarded we're very mistrustful of the system and the yeah. systems and now i'm in a session with a black person you really expect me to be this closed person with no yeah. like me leaning in and sharing like even not to say I'm disclosing and going into detail, but right? No, yeah. Saying to someone like I know um, that it is hard because I went through that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I too, like, I too, a familiar place. Yeah, yeah. Like, I too experienced that. This worked for me, but yeah. let's see what works for you. You know, yes. It kind of reminds them like, oh, you're a human, and I, what I'm saying is is not crazy because that's. Yeah. What think of like this yeah. even the the abuse or trauma i had a client that talked about work and how she felt targeted and i was like i'm a black woman in work too like i yeah. know what you're yeah. talking about yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that solidarity can mean so much yeah i that think alone. we need it as a people to go okay you have a life outside of this and you hear me yes that we both are bringing our whole selves into the therapeutic relationship. Yeah. It's crucial. It's so crucial. It is. We need to have people that we feel are real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need to have authentic. Yeah. We need to be able to feel our authentic selves in that big time. Big time. Mm -hmm. Want to dance a little? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Cause I'm looking at the clock and I'm like, we should really do something. We should move. Mm -hmm. Cause we've been, when I say we should do something, we have been doing something. This conversation yeah. has been phenomenal and I can't wait to like look at it again and dive <laughs> into it while I'm editing it. But uh, yeah, let's dance. I feel like I want to like make some tape. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yay. laughs> That's so fabulous. <laughs> Ooh, Lord. Okay, so here's what's going to happen now. <laughs> So I'm going to close this meeting just so that the recording will start to render. And then I'm going to open iMovie and send you another link. And I'm going to hop back on again. So that we can do a little bit of editing. Okay. All right, see you in a little bit.